So last week, just as I was finishing up, uh, I got interrupted in the recording, but just since there was only like about another minute of the guys getting back from the mission, I decided to just let it play out. Um, so this is actually the uh, after action report from that mission last time around. And then we're going to get some story elements here in just a minute. Hello, Commander. The council you once knew is no more. Its membership have all sworn loyalty to the Advent Administration. With one exception. It is good to see you again. In the days since your capture, I have done all I can to aid the Resistance from the inside. It was these Resistance operatives that provided the intel leading to your recent extraction. As of now, Resistance forces are currently somewhat disorganized. If we are to defeat Advent and their alien masters, you must change this before it is too late. What you are seeing are classified reports of missing civilians from across the world. Their numbers are growing. We suspect they have been taken to a nearby Advent Black Site, though its exact location remains unknown. Time is short, Commander. We need you to take charge of resistance operations throughout the world. Establish contact with the local cells and bring them into the fold. Find this black site and shut it down. Save our world. The clock is ticking. Good luck, Commander. New objective added. So those are our new Commission objectives. Progress, Commander. I've updated our objectives based on the and latest findings. Considering the... the limited resources available to you, Commander, you have still managed to exceed my expectations. Excellent work. Now that we have more staff on the engineering team, we can start clearing so up that's our engineer. facilities, Commander. We should keep looking for more recruits, though. We'll need them to staff the facilities once the... And at this point, I just saved the game, so... No worries there. We'll just get back into the game here and get going. First thing I'm going to do is get the engineer clearing some of these debris away. And you can see it's going to give me some supplies. Um, as you get further down, it gives you more supplies and alien alloys. That one will give me 11 alloys. This one will give me none. But it takes longer the further down you get. Now I'm going to go down right here in the center here because I'm heading toward that power coil because we're going to need power here and Commander, so far, not too far long. Critical among the alien components left over yeah, the yeah, area. yeah. If we clean this stuff out, we could probably use this space for a new facility. Uh huh. That's the idea. Underway, Commander, but it's going to take some time to get all that stuff cleared out. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saving this one for is uh, why won't it, there we go. Up in the objectives, it says to uh, research resistance communications. When that gets done, it's going to give us the option to build a communications facility there so we can contact more, more of the resistance. Here, this will show you what I mean. Local resistance forces in the area can get you into the site, but you will need to make contact with their network first. This is only the beginning, Commander. Your leadership will be a beacon to our people across the globe. Well, I certainly hope so. We'll Commander, see how well I do. You're not gonna believe this. We just picked up a signal from an emergency locator beacon. It's definitely one of ours, from the original invasion. I know it sounds crazy, but if there's any chance some of our people could still be out there, I think we owe it to them to find out. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Okay, so anyhow, the world gets broken up into these regions, and you need a, you need communications facilities to contact them, and you only get so many. Uh, and then you have to build more facilities or other things to contact more regions. So that's what they're talking about there, and that's what I'm going to have to research, and then I'll build it right there. Now this week we're going to be concentrating on Plato, 
But the trouble is, when you look through all my soldiers, Plato isn't there. And that's because the game didn't give him to me at the start. It randomizes who it gives you. So we gotta go in here and recruit him. We've had our suspicions, but before now we've never had the resources uh -huh, to investigate uh -huh. the possibility of clandestine advent facilities uh -huh, uh -huh. outside the city centers. Now that we've gotten word so, of this black site, I have to There he is. There's he, now he's down there at the bottom, so we can use him in the next mission. They could be doing anything in there. Now, this is the start of uh, one of those uh, DLC missions that gives you the extra stuff where I chose not to integrate it but just to play the mission. But I think I'm going to go finish the supplies first while we're waiting for the research to get done so I can start researching resistance communications. Excellent timing. There's been some progress. I've managed to break down several key components of the chip implanted into your skull. My analysis reveals that its primary function was that of a conduit, passing a vast amount of data directly to your cerebral cortex. With the primary connection severed, much of that data is lost. Several fragments do remain, however. Uh, ghosts, if you will. Observe. Tactical combat simulations. War games. The sheer volume of encounters you were processing was astounding. It... It is truly remarkable that you survived as long as you did. Though this may seem disconcerting, there is still some good news. This chip bears a striking resemblance to a medical implant I briefly assisted in developing at the Gene Therapy Clinic in New Providence. My understanding was that the implants were intended for high-ranking Advent officers only, captains or above. Retrieving a chip from such an officer would be the only way to know for certain. A greater understanding of these implants would undoubtedly benefit us all, Commander. New objective added. The Advent officers have clearly been modified to allow for their subordinates to receive new orders psionically. The implanted chip... Okay, so now we can build an infirmary which will allow our soldiers to heal from their wounds faster. During the course oh, of research, okay. This is a feature they added to uh, War of the Chosen where they can get a, a breakthrough that'll enable them to research new, some items faster, or you can get an additional research option like this. This means that from now on, if I research this, all of our shotguns are going to have an additional place for putting a weapon mod on there. In this case, if I don't research this now, it's going to go away. So, that's what I'm going to do, because that'll be pretty useful. Valuable applications stemming from this technology. The thing have I liked about uh, uh, this game is those war games that he was referring to were all scenes from the first game where they kind of imply that the first game might have just been happening in the commander's mind and didn't actually really occur. And so, and since we, a lot of us played that first XCOM game over and over again, that's why there were so many uh, different scenarios we ran through. So that was kind of clever. I think that'll finish up there. Strategic resource located. So, do I go for the engineer? I'm gonna go for this one. Because that's gonna give us some more loot and equipment that'll help our guys be a little bit more effective. You'll see what I mean here when it gets done. If we can finish it before they give us a new mission. The skirmishers are Advent. Advent is the enemy. The enemy is food. Try not to bring that up when we meet, Hulk. You take their side after all we've seen these years. Look, I'm not exactly having drinks with them, but they did hold up their end of the bargain. What about you? 
wait and see. Bolt out. Actually think they might show up. Commander, that was Konstantin Volokov. Volk to his friends. He and his Reapers are a big part of the reason why you're standing here today. Volk may be a little rough around the edges, but he's the real deal. Heads one of three resistance groups operating independently from us that we consider a legitimate threat to Advent. Together, they'd make one hell of a fighting force. Too bad they hate each other. Still, we've made some unlikely progress. Volk's Reapers may have found you, but they weren't acting alone. They were tipped off by a group of Advent defectors known as the Skirmishers. No one's big on working with these guys, knowing where they came from. But you wouldn't be here without their help. Both the Reapers and the Skirmishers have agreed to suspend hostilities, provided you serve as the go-between. Trust doesn't come easy between these two, so we're heading for a nice, quiet spot on neutral ground. Even so, let's not take any chances. Intel on this area is weak, and we're picking up strange chatter on comms. Not to mention we're ending a decade-long blood feud today. I'd advise our soldiers to be fully prepared before we deploy on this one, Commander. Good luck. I hate to ask, but it looks like I don't have much choice. Think you could help us out? I don't know how much more prepared we can get, and I also... Apparently, for some reason, Commander Riker from Star Trek changed his name to Volk when he Not moved sure into back to Earth. Are going to wait for us, Commander. So I'd recommend we proceed as soon as possible. All available soldiers are standing by to deploy. So this is the start of the uh, War of the Chosen story missions, and it doesn't actually give me an option, as you can see, to uh, not do it. So we're just going to have to go without the loot I was hoping to get from that abandoned crash site. Each faction has agreed to allow a two-person squad to escort them to the rendezvous point. Hopefully that should be enough to keep them from killing each other. We've got a temporary ceasefire in place for the duration of the meet, but still, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be ready for anything. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to want to put... Well... I'm going to put Plato with these guys. Put the scope with a Socrates since he's the sniper. And the critical chance will be more useful for a ranger, so we're not going to put any weapon mods on his right now. And put Socrates back into action and give him the scope. That increases his odds of hitting by 5%, as you see, which isn't a whole lot, but this early in the game, it can make a pretty big difference. And here we go. throats for years, so we're keeping the exact meeting point strictly need to know. You'll split into two squads, rendezvous with each faction, and bring their envoy directly to the location of the meet. Officially, this city no longer exists, so we don't expect a lot in the way of Advent resistance. Still, keep your eyes peeled. It's been about 20 years since we last stepped foot in this place. If 
you are hungry, there's more where that came from. Impressive reflexes, but unnecessary. Stand down. We're all friends here. You are safe here. More so than you imagine. We shall see if the same holds true for these skirmishes of yours. Your presence already disturbs them. We must move quickly. My people will take care of this camp. Come. Uploading the coordinates to the rendezvous point now. We've plotted the most direct route there. We don't know much about the skirmisher contact you'll be meeting other than his name. Mox. Mox? Praetor Mox? His death squads wiped out entire camps of my people in the first years of the war. You would dare do this? Pretty sure hands are bloody on both sides of this fight. That's the whole point of this intervention. Reapers are born in the shadows. In the cold, harsh world that was waiting for us out there. We rely on stealth and long-range attacks. And our marksmen are unmatched. Yeah, that's actually uh, not true. A fully well-trained XCOM sharpshooter outdoes a fully, uh, fully trained chained Reaper. But they are very useful in that they always start in concealment, and their form of concealment, i.e., shadow, is a lot, lot harder to. Uh, it's a. It's a lot harder for the enemies to detect them, so they're very, very useful as scouts. I always have the Reapers run ahead, see what they're doing. Damaged and dormant all these years, these devices still emit trace elements of unstable radiation. I cannot fathom what they were like in their original function. We were there, Doctor. You're better off having missed it. Okay, so... Even though there's radiation, let's have her move up and sight ahead for us. Go where you tell me. And Plato and Nietzsche can follow suit. We've got to go. Oh, we just got to make it there. Okay. Solid copy. This being XCOM, of course, that'll be harder than it looks. The Lost. No more time for regrets. We are not alone. Those things, they still look like people. What was human died years ago. Only the taint of the alien survives now. Where there is one, more will follow. You must not hesitate to destroy them. These creatures' DNA has mutated well beyond what we would classify as human. Perhaps the result of long-term exposure to the alien radiation from those... Oh, bodies. no. Though why anyone would subject themselves to that, I cannot imagine. When the government fell, millions starved. Many fled to cities such as this to scavenge for food. They did not heed the warnings. Well, that's not good. I didn't mean to activate that many more. So the Lost are XCOM zombies. That's really all there is to it. These creatures' true strength lies in their numbers. As you can see, they fall easily. Yeah. If we are careful with our shots, we will prevail. What it's saying here is that every time you can kill a lost with a, a shot, it calls it a headshot and then allows you to take another shot. Essentially, only it doesn't use a full action, which is the only way you can really deal with the swarms of them that you get, especially this early in the game. Now she missed, so yeah. I have no ammunition. Now, one nice thing about the Lost and all uh, 
they only fight melee, they come up and try and hit you. So you really don't need to worry about cover with them as much. Because it, it just doesn't make a difference. Cover doesn't prevent melee in this game. Hey, not a bad shot, Plato. Let's see if you can make this one too. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, you ought to get a promotion out of that. He doesn't have a line of sight on the other one. Let's put him in Overwatch and see if Nietzsche can get this other one. Good deal. Now you can reload since Plato's already in uh, Overwatch. Get him. Ah! I got nothing. Come on, Plato. My people have encountered these beings before. At first, they may appear mindless, but they hear quite well. In great numbers, they can be very deadly. All right, let's get Nietzsche closer, and he'll have better odds of taking those two guys out then. Oh, uh, and more, of course. You couldn't have zombies without it being a horde, you know. Just a couple of them aren't, isn't scary enough. Hey, not so bad, Ubermensch. Yeah! Now, another nice thing about the Reapers is when they break concealment like she did when she took that shot, they can go right back into it. She can only do that once each mission, though. So can you get the last guy, Plato? We'll see. All right. Good deal, Plato. An entire city of our own people left to turn into these things. Yes. So All we see. can offer them now is a merciful death. Let's get back up here and just go around the corner of the building. I think that'll be a little easier to deal with than going through the building. Yeah. Take a peek around the corners. Yep, there's some more. But see, now since she's in concealment, no big deal. They didn't come after her. And then I'll put... And Plato and Nietzsche can step up, covering everybody's backs like that. These creatures are worse even than Advent. They have no cause, no fear. They simply exist. If we do not defeat the aliens soon, we will become little more than they are. Well, with that chilling statement, it uh, might be useful to talk a little bit about the concept of a philosophical zombie, which is something you probably have never heard before if you haven't started philosophy. You know, everybody knows what an actual zombie is. It's just, you know, a mindless killing, eating machine, etc., etc. Well, the concept of a philosophical zombie is taking that a little further. Uh, it's not really a zombie in the same sense that the Lost or the zombies in a movie are, but there's a... If you uh, look for kind of absolute standards of proof, it then becomes very, very difficult to, to pr actually prove that other people really have minds like you, yours. Like, you know, if you meet another person and they speak and act in a rational way, you're probably going to think, oh, well, that's another person. They've got a mind like me, and, you know, if you're not a strict materialist or physicalist, you'll probably think, oh, they've got a soul like me too. But that's very difficult to prove in an absolute sense, because 
you know, how would you even go about that? You're really just assuming it based on the fact that they look and act like you do, like what you would expect that somebody to. And that's what a philosophical zombie is. It's the idea that, well, how do you know everybody else around you really aren't a bunch of, uh, you know, how do you, machines that just look and act human? How do you know that they don't, uh, you know, just give the appearance of being actual people when they really aren't actual people? And it's actually pretty difficult in the strictest sense to really prove that. But at the same time, you know, it seemed pretty stupid to just... Uh huh. Yeah. We will make it to your pet at the yeah, yeah. Time. I was talking, guys. It's rude to interrupt. But the point is, it's like, even though that's difficult to prove, I mean, you'd feel pretty. St well, how can I say this? The point is, even though that's difficult to prove, most of us would think you're going to be pretty stupid if you go around treating everybody else like they're not really people, because they just obviously seem to be really people. In fact, uh, the philosopher Alvin Plantinga has taken that and argued that belief in other minds, that is, belief that people are not philosophical zombies, is just a properly basic belief. It just seems so inherently obvious you don't really need to justify anything on it. And if you don't shut up and let me talk, I'll kill you myself. So that's a good example of what they'll call a properly basic belief. It's a belief that is justifiable just because it's so immediately obvious to you. And that's a somewhat controversial concept because most a lot of people think it simplifies things too much that to it simplifies things too much to say that it's a prop to just write things off as properly basic beliefs, you know. Planago would also say that things like me sitting on this couch, talking to a microphone, playing XCOM right now, that I have the belief that I'm doing that, and that is properly basic just because it's so obviously apparent to me that that's what I'm doing. Uh, and some people who study epistemology say, no, no, that's just way too easy. It's got to be way more complicated than that. But uh, myself, I think that's, kind of, that's at least a somewhat plausible explanation. I, you know, I, I haven't really decided, but... It's, a, it's plausible to go that way of properly basic beliefs. And so that's what the philosophical zombies are, and one possible solution to it. Central, biological signatures are grouping into a singular mass, one closing in on this position. A swarm. We must push forward before it arrives. Well, then I guess we better move, huh? You don't have shots on any of those guys up there? Because we're going to have to fight through them about you. Oh, good. Okay, if I put Plato up there, that'll they'll activate, come closer, and then both Plato and Nietzsche can take shots, and hopefully the Reaper can maintain her cover. Oh, those aren't good odds. Okay. Oh, come on, Plato. People say that all of philo philosophical history is supposed to be just a footnote to you, and you can't even make a simple shot like that? Yeah, the Ubermensch is showing you up. Badly. Well, he didn't save us, but he still did better than... Okay, so... They're gonna go for these guys, so I'm gonna move her over here, because I want her to maintain her cover. No, just go into overwatch. When I put her into overwatch when she's concealed like that, she'll only take a shot if something comes along and breaks her cover. For years my people hunted his kind. For years we survived. Now you risk everything for your dreams of peace. If you haven't noticed, the aliens have been kicking our planet's ass for the past 20 years. You think maybe it's time we try something else? If only your speeches could take down these cursed creatures. Closing on target position now. I'm guessing she wouldn't think philosophy's very useful if she quits speeches like that. There you go, Plato. Biological readings in your general area are clear. No more creatures on approach. For now. Then let's not linger here. Head to the evac coordinates now. 
Okay, she's gonna be first in. Though their intelligence appears almost non-existent, these creatures seem to employ some sort of rudimentary communication system. Perhaps auditory signals or some form of hive-like consciousness. There we go. Roland. You should have a clear path through now. Second squad is already en route to Mox. Proceed to the rendezvous and await their arrival. Oh, we'll be there. Looks like trouble ahead. The rendezvous could be compromised. Stay focused. Contact! Get down! We may have a bigger problem here. I'm guessing that's our man. Well, our contact anyway. Crunk side. Advent. Hobbit. Rendezvous with Outrider is further ahead. Proceed through this district as quickly as possible, but be careful. Something tells me this city still has a few more surprises to throw our way. Surprises are the least of our worries today. It is these Reapers of yours that are of true concern. We, the Skirmishers, were created by the false gods of this world to serve and die as their puppets. We retain all that we were and more, and our prowess in battle serves us well in our cause. In close combat, none can stand opposed to us. Okay, so I edited out a little of the loading times there. Um, the skirmishers are a pretty good unit. He gets a lot more abilities as you go on, but right from the start, he's got a grappling hook that he can use to pull himself ahead, which gives him a lot more movement on the battlefield, as you can see. And also, I don't quite get it, but... So, this guy is voiced by Commander w by Worf from Star Trek. The Reaper's voiced by, uh... Counselor Troy from Star Trek. The other guy's Commander Riker. It's almost like they got the whole cast of Star Trek involved in this game somehow. Which I suppose is cool, but it's just a little odd. that height advantage for anything that shows up. Socrates get up on height advantage anywhere. Yeah, let's put him up there and let him use that height advantage. remember seeing these things before. You were not meant to. Purifiers were created with a singular purpose, to contain the Drop 10, the Lost. We must eliminate this patrol quickly before others arrive. Fine by me. Take them down. Well, those aren't very good odds. Neither's that. Now, one nice thing he has, see, uh, here, let me compare for you. Pascal fires his weapon, it ends his turn. This guy does, it doesn't. Hit firing his weapon counts as only half of his turn. Which in a sense is a little bit like getting a free 
There we go. Not bad. Now that's a grapple, as it says, it'll pull that guy toward him and then he can strike him with the little claw things he's got on his arm gauntlet there. The trouble is uh, that those, uh, what they call purifiers, the flamethrower troops, sometimes they explode when uh, something happens. And I would rather avoid uh, having him blow up right in one of my guy's faces. That's not good odds. Mostly because of the cover, okay. Wait till he breaks for cut from cover and you do the same, and we'll see how that works out. Ah, no good. You both missed. See, this is what I mean about the soldiers being almost worthless this early in the game. I have no idea how that missed. It should have taken out Pascal. Sets poor Socrates on fire. Now the only thing to do, drop him down there. Hunker down makes the fire stop. I can put him up there and he'll still have the height advantage. What they often do. Careful with these things. Now that we truck's on fire, and it's probably going to blow up here in a little bit, so we need to get Pascal out of there. Put him over there out of range. And hopefully he just takes that guy out. Come on, seriously? I really don't like it how these guys missed so many of their shots so often. Is he gonna go after poor Socrates again? Yep. But it looks like he missed. Okay, get in there and flank him, Socrates. This probably won't be enough to kill him with just a pistol. Yep. Shot at him, Pascal. Don't want to use the grenade yet because there's something else coming in this uh, mission that's going to be uh, worse, and I want to save him for that. Okay, I guess we got to do this. Hope it doesn't blow up in his face. Okay, we got lucky. Patrol has been liberated. May their lives not be lost in vain. We must push forward and complete our mission. Works for me. Move out. Get back up there now. Oh. Well, oh. we can go really high. Roger. That ought to give him good line of sight over a large part of the map.
Purifiers may be down, but unfortunately, that was our extraction point. I fear that is not the worst of it. Multiple biological signatures rapidly on approach to your position. The lost, the sound of combat excite them. They are drawn to it. And you just blew up a fuel truck? There was no other choice. Find an alternate exit. We will deal with the lost. Yeah, I'm with Central on this one. I, uh, that wasn't too smart to blow that up and bring them all here. An apt description. It would seem the mutation has somehow accelerated these dashers' metabolism, allowing enhanced speed and agility, with a corresponding increase in aggression. Oh, you might be able to get most of those for us, Socrates. He's probably going to run out of ammo before he runs out of targets. That's here. Height advantage. See the height advantage. Oh, hang on. The height advantage and the scope are really making the huge difference there. Now we'll have him reload, and maybe he can still hit those guys with his pistol. Yeah, small chance. Yeah, better than nothing. How do you get over there so quickly? I guess the story demanded it. Okay. Moving there. That's not very good odds. Get up there and we'll see if you can use the height advantage. Tactical movement. Out of range. Oh well. And you get up there with him, Pascal. And we'll pull Socrates over in a minute or two. Come on. Not bad. reverberated throughout most of the city. I would expect a significant reaction from the lost. The only reaction I will accept from them is their deaths. Now, so you can I see here Socrates has his full movement range. Because the it, the headshot refunds an action and the pistol doesn't take ammo, I can take these two guys out. Nemico neutralizzato. And he's still got his full range of actions. So. That's nice. Hmm, two to three. No, he'd probably... It'd probably only give him two damage even if he did hit. It's better for him to move. Try and get Pascal to get that guy. You can't get the guy right below you? Well, alright. Go ahead and reload. And we might as well have him reload too. Well, we got a chance. And go back into Overwatch. There we go. They will fight no more. That whole area is hotter than we thought. Gonna need a little more time. Understood. Holding position. So we can do the same thing here again with Socrates. Perfect. 
taglio inerme. And then get him up there with the other guys. Do what you can. Nice. Cible liquidé. Je reste en observation. These guys are working as a pretty good team. Readings are all over the place. The lost are almost right on top of you. These lost seem to be pretty sensitive to noise. The sounds of combat are likely to draw even more of them. Cible eliminé. Think we've got something here. Just need another minute. You have your minute. Okay. I don't see any targets, so just put everyone in Overwatch or reload. Must reload now. Watch order confirmed. Well, that's really close. You're a sniper. We found a new route that should get you to the rendezvous point safely. The lost are still converging on the area, so make it fast. That will not be a problem. All right, so we gotta move. There we go. I don't want to have him fire at the ones that have three or more, because it's not a guarantee. And then he'll lose a movement point, and we gotta move. Two, that's a guarantee. Okay. So, time to go. I bet he can probably go right over there. On, yep, right over there on top of that truck. He'll maintain his uh, height advantage. And he's still got all his movement points. Oh, I was really hoping you have line of sight on more guys than just that. I found a, just another good rule of thumb for this game is when you've still got two of your action points left and you're about to go into Overwatch and you're not going to move the guy or anything, just reload. Oh, you know, there's no reason not to at that point. Okay, so you better run over this way too, Pascal. Okay, je bouge. Socrates got himself surrounded. Oh. Sniper rifles, you can see weapon range. He gets penalties the closer they get, rather than the further they get. So we want to have him use his pistol here in close range if he can. There we go. Everybody should be able to get in. I will 
Go. Perfect. Outrider and the first team should be waiting for you ahead. I know this wasn't the easiest stop, but I have to believe it'll still be worth it in the end. That depends on the Reapers. Rendezvous point directly ahead. Let's try and play nice today, people. Vance's most brutal captain comes to atone for his crimes. I am no longer that being. I am free now. Taking off that helmet does not change what you are. Reapers have long memories. Elder Kraxad. Any time. The way I see it, we have two options. Join forces and kick the Elders off our world, or kill each other here and now. The choice is yours. No one has ever done that before. No one shall ever do that again. Prima, elder assassin, relentless death that stalks my kind, butcher of free elephant. My people face another like her. They are the undying, advent's curse upon us. We must combine strength if we are to have any chance of success. You are welcome to try. Space of being such as this. They appeared without warning years ago. We will ago. just try. We'll Had take her out. We would have already regained our home. Okay. <laughs> such arrogance. Oh, right. The elders' will extends throughout the universe. I am the one of their. We'll squad together. Good deal. That thing's ordered. down there somewhere. We gotta find it and kill it. She doesn't have a sight on it. Keep Socrates up here where he can get the height advantage. Hope we can kill her quick because we're coming up on the, uh, well, coming up on the time limit here. I don't mean in the game. I mean I've been recording for just about an hour. I reload. Not evade detection. All right, open fire if you see her. Heading to that location. Affirmative. Covering now. You, Plato, and you, you guys all open fire if you see her. Or it, whatever. Seemed like it was female. My watch begins. I guess you better do the same thing. Join me. Uh, let's see. Oh, well, I guess Overwatch is useless against her this time around. These, uh... There's three of them, uh, three of these uh, chosen. The assassin is the first one you meet if you do the story options, and they always get different strengths and weaknesses. Um, so, so with Shadow Step, she doesn't tri ever trigger Overwatch as a reaction fire, so you, that's just worthless. Um, but uh, I do believe the weakness is where their adversaries are always the same. So her adversary is the Reapers, which may, means she's going to take increased damage from that Reaper. It was the right move leaving everybody on high ground, though, if she takes is easier to target from high ground. I will go. So we just need to get find her. Uh. My 
position is safe. Everybody spread out a little bit. Since she uh, doesn't trigger Overwatch reactions, I'm just going to put it, have everybody hunker down instead of Overwatch. Hunker down, as you can see, makes them increases dodge by 50 and defense by 30. So maybe we'll get lucky and some of her shots will miss. She got Socrates. Socrates has just taken such a beating in this game. Now, use the talents of XCOM's great commander in action. Okay. Make it there with your claymore. Oh, so close. That's a shame. Reaper's Claymore is a mine that she can throw and then shoot, but anybody can shoot. And since the Chosen's standing right next to that car, it'll probably set up the car, and so we'll get a double damage effect. Since she's in Overwatch, anybody I drop down there is going to trigger that Overwatch. So, let's just use the... Pascal's grenade instead. Perfect. Should be at a triple explosion with this. Yep. emitting from that pod or crisscrossing a massive area. Meaning that thing just rang the dinner bell for every remaining lost in the city. An accurate assessment. The entire lost biomass seems to be converging on this position. Then let's get you all the hell out of there. Firebrand's en route to the evac coordinates now. Get moving. Right, now let's... This is exactly why you always need to bring a medkit with you. See, she got Socrates knocked down and bleeding out there. He's gonna die in three turns. Gremlin, but we can stabilize him with the med kit. And now, as long as somebody's around to carry him, Close and in this case, Plato's gonna carry Socrates, kind of like he actually did in real life, and that we really wouldn't even know much about you. Socrates if not for Plato. And Plato's going to carry Socrates out of here so he lives to fight another day. But I've gone a full hour, and since I went a little bit over last time, I'm not going to do that this time. I'm going to save the game, and we'll uh, pick up their escape from this city next week. So Plato was a Greek philosopher who lived from approximately 423 or 428 BC to 348 or 347 BC. The exact dates are a bit uncertain. He was one of Socrates' students. He was such a prolific and influential philosopher that Alfred North Whitehead said that all of European philosophy is just a footnote to Plato. 
and the contemporary philosopher at Notre Dame, Alistair McIntyre, said, For philosophy, if it is to be recognizable as philosophy, must always be understood as a continuation of Plato's enterprise. Now, these might be a bit of an overstatement, but they demonstrate just how big of a deal Plato is. If you've ever read a nonfiction book or taken a class on a subject, there is a remarkably high chance that something you read or learned can at least be indirectly traced back to something Plato said. That's how pervasive his influence is. For example, Plato was the first to define knowledge as justified true belief. This definition stood fine until about 50 years ago when Edmund Gettier showed that it doesn't always work with his Gettier problems. However, Gettier didn't show that Plato was wrong, only that his definition of knowledge was incomplete. Knowledge is justified true belief, plus something else, and now everyone is arguing over what that something else is. Plato also predicted in the Republic that a democracy will decay into a tyranny because people will abuse their liberty. Thus, when the abuse of liberty gets too severe, a tyrant will be the only thing that can restore some order. This certainly seems like a relevant statement today, even though it's over 2,000 years old. So, when I was creating Plato's character for XCOM, I wanted his nickname to be something like, You're all just footnotes to me, but that and every similar line I could come up with was too long, too many characters to fit in there. The major reason why Plato's influence is so pervasive is that he is in all practical senses the first Western philosopher to come up with a totalizing system. After him, most philosophers for the next 2,000 years or so came up with their own totalizing systems, or adopted and modified a previous philosopher's system, and usually it was Plato or Aristotle's system. It's quite possible other philosophers prior to Plato had their own totalizing systems, but records of these philosopher's systems have just been lost to time. By a totalizing system here, I don't just mean that Plato had something to say about everything, though he pretty much did. Rather, I mean that he developed and argued for a system of thought that attempts to explain all of existence, everything we can see and observe, by just a few key principles and points. Thus, he had points to make on ethics, epistemology, metaphysics, politics, and even science, though it was not called science then and the discipline was in its infancy. And he attempted to ground all these points by just a few key principles and ideas. Now, most philosophers in the contemporary world have abandoned this quest for a totalizing system, and there's a variety of reasons for that, some good and some bad. And the last serious attempt at such a system was probably from the early German phenomenologist in the early 20th century. Ayn Rand did attempt to create and argue for her own totalizing system as late as the 50s through the 70s, but most philosophers don't consider her to be a philosopher, or at least not a very good philosopher, and most people think her system was really pretty bad. Perhaps I'll talk more about that in a future episode. The works we have of Plato that survive are a series of dialogues and some letters. Some of these are in dispute as contemporary scholars and philosophers doubt that Plato actually wrote them. But fortunately, most of Plato's most interesting works are not in dispute. There is no serious doubt that I'm aware of that Plato wrote the Republic, the Apology, and so on. A nice thing about Plato is that since he wrote primarily in dialogues, he is remarkably easy to read. His dialogues are nothing more than a bunch of characters sitting, or maybe standing, around and discussing various issues and ideas. For example, in Phaedo, Socrates and other characters discuss the nature of the soul and what that nature means. In the Republic, Socrates and other characters discuss the nature of justice and attempt to devise a way to form a perfect state. Most short lessons on Plato will talk about his allegory of the cave and attempt to relate that to something contemporary people can understand. And again, there's a whole host of reasons for that, mostly because it's just easy to teach. But I'm not going to do that. If you want to understand Plato's cave, go watch those introductions or watch the movies The Matrix and The Truman Show. Both of those movies will get you the general idea and they're far more entertaining than anything I can put together. At least, the first Matrix is far more entertaining than anything I can put together. Instead, I'm going to give you a breakdown of Plato's idea of the forms, as it seems this was his most central point, it's the central idea of Platonism, and the forms are actually the main point the allegory of the cave is trying to drive at. Platonic forms are Plato's solution to the problem of universals. The problem of universals is a very basic and fundamental philosophical question. How you answer this question will determine a lot about what you think about many other things. 
And well, it was about 600 years later, the Greek logician Porphyry, I'm probably mispronouncing that, oh well, was the first to, well, he was the first to formally express the problem of universals, but Plato seems to have been the first to directly propose a solution, and his solution is the Platonic forms. Here's an explanation of the problem of universals. It does require a little abstract thinking, but I think most people should be able to understand this. Think about an elephant. The elephant is probably gray, as most elephants are gray. Now, no one ever observes the color gray apart from something that is gray. Every time you see the color gray, it is a property of another thing that is made of matter. You see things that are gray, but you never see gray by itself removed from any, everything else. And yet, don't you have a conception of gray in your mind that isn't tied to any individual thing? I know I do, and that's how I can say that both an elephant and a battleship are the same color. Well, almost the same color in these examples. So now, how can I have a concept of something that I've never observed independently of something else? If you grasp that question, then you understand the problem of universals. We want to say that the color gray exists, as this just seems obvious, but how can we claim it exists without some way to ground or reference that claim? I can easily claim that my dog exists because I can find him and point to him in the world, but I cannot seem to find gray by itself in the world, so how can I claim it exists when I cannot find it and point to it in the world? And this problem doesn't just apply to colors, it applies to everything that would be considered a universal. We never see an instance of man or woman that is not also a distinct individual. You don't find the concepts of man or woman in the world like you find a dog, a table, or a chair. You find individuals who have the property of being a man or being a woman. The same problem applies to nearly everything that we use a general noun to name. So it applies to books, movies, computers, cars, nationalities like American or British, professions like doctor or lawyer, and so on. So it seems this is a big problem. J.P. Moreland uh, gives a slightly more technical explanation of the problem. Prima facie, it would seem that properties exist. Indeed, one of the most obvious facts about the world is that it consists of individual things that have properties and stand in relations to other things. It would also seem that several objects have the same property. For example, several things possess the same shade of red. But both the existence and nature of properties have long been a matter of dispute, and the problem of universals is the name for the issue central to this debate. Now, the trouble here is that it seems we need to make use of these universal concepts in order to actually live in the world. So when you make a basic argument like the following, one, all men are mortal, two, Socrates is a man, three, therefore Socrates is mortal. I need to know men, mortal, and Socrates enough that I can say what all men are, what it always means to be mortal, and who and what Socrates is. Now, Socrates is an individual, but men and mortal are universals. If universals aren't true or grounded in some sense, then it becomes very hard to see how these arguments work. The problem is even more fundamental than most scientific questions. For example, we know gravity is a force of attraction that exists between all things that have matter, and with an understanding of this and other physical laws, we can accomplish all kinds of great things with science and technology. The trouble is, there are at least eight universal terms in that prior sentence. Force, attraction, matter, understanding, physical, laws, science, technology. Now, some philosophers would include exists in this list as they think existence is a universal, but this is a bit of a controversial thing and it gets very deep into metaphysics, so I won't cover that here. So the question is, do properties like gray exist, and if so, how? If you're having trouble understanding this problem, check out the link I'll include in the description or pick up J.P. Moreland's book called Universals. Now, Plato's solution to the problem is to, so to speak, swap perspectives as he argues that all universals are merely imperfect representations of the universals or the form of that universal. So all the examples of gray we see are merely imperfect representations or images, copies of the perfect gray. Plato argues that there are really two kinds of reality. There is the physical world that we see and observe that is filled with all kinds of things, dogs, tables, chairs, 
and there is an immaterial world of the forms where the perfect and best possible expressions of all these things exist. And Plato argues that we know this immaterial world with our minds through these concepts. Some have called Plato's solution extreme realism, as it argues that the universals or forms are even more real than the actual individual things we observe. So Plato thought that the gray that is a property of the elephant and battleship is more real than the elephant or the battleship. The elephant will get old, die, and decay, and the battleship will lose its paint and rust. But the platonic form of the gray is timeless, immaterial, and unchangeable. Hence, platonic forms are more real than the actual world. Now, with this understanding of platonic forms, it's easy to see what Plato is getting at by his allegory of the cave, and just how this relates to movies like The Matrix or The Truman Show. In The Matrix, Neo finds out that the actual world isn't real, but is simply an expression of the real world, i.e., the physical world is less real than the world of the forms, and when Neo recognizes this, he gains incredible power. Now, I'm pretty sure no one has ever used Platonism to dodge bullets, but it's you can see the obvious parallels at work here. Now, platonic forms do answer the problem of universals in that there now is something to ground things like gray, force, attraction, law, beauty, man, woman, and so on. But the trouble is that it posits the existence of a whole other world to explain and ground these things. In a certain sense, it's kind of an extreme ad hoc solution that defies common sense and strains its credulity. When you have to create a whole other world to make your theory work, well, that's probably a sign there's something wrong with your theory. In case you didn't pick up on it, I don't subscribe to Plato's forms. While they do technically solve the problem of universals, they also introduce other problems, like how it is these forms and the observable world interact, where did the forms come from, and how do we know this world of forms actually exists. Plato's explanation seems to be ad hoc and to confuse the abstract, the gray, with the concrete, the gray on the elephant and on the battleship. Now, I hope if any Platonists watch this, you'll think I've fairly represented Plato here. I've tried to, and he, even though I think he was wrong, he was clearly a genius. Uh, some later philosophers took Plato's idea and have improved on it. Platonism probably reached its strongest form under Neoplatonism with Plotinus, and I hope to cover Plotinus in a future episode. Also in contemporary philosophy, Platonism has experienced a bit of a resurgence, as there have been a surprisingly large number of Platonists in the last hundred years or so. Now Plato did have an awful lot to say about many other things, but most of them were based on Platonic forms, as, like the good philosopher he is, Plato tried to go all the way down to what he thought was the most fundamental principle, and then work his way back up again. If you can get a grasp of Platonic forms, you'll probably be able to get a decent grasp of most of the rest of Plato's philosophy. Plato's solution to universals falls into the category of realism. Platonic forms were the first of several other types of realism that have been proposed, and these solutions are so-called because they all claim that universals are in some sense real. The opposite of this is to deny that universals are real, and this is typically called nominalism. But nominalism didn't come about until much, much later. Now, you can find all of Plato's work online easily enough, and if you read his main works like The Republic, he's pretty easy to follow. Some of the more obscure ones are a bit boring and difficult, but The Republic's pretty good. Next week, we'll look at Plato's student Aristotle, who proposed a different solution to universals, and is usually credited with being the first to discover or categorize the rules of logic. And you know, standard YouTube stuff, like subscribe, leave a comment, get those algorithms working for me. Thanks.